Hi, my name is Ken Kinder, and I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. And the purpose of this presentation is to discuss the relationship between genetics, epigenetics, trauma, and brain development. So as always, if you like what you're hearing, go tell somebody. Um, comments and feedback are welcome, particularly about subjects you would like us to take on. And as always, thanks for watching. The project that I work for is called the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative. It is a joint venture between Rutgers University, the New Jersey Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, without their support, nothing this video nor none of the work that we do would be able to be possible. Our mission is to improve the quality of care, improve working conditions, and bring evidence-based practices to New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals, and their support is critical for that mission. So this video is something that we've alluded to in other videos. If you've seen the videos about uh, addictions and trauma, this kind of ties into that, but it also goes a little bit more into the, the biology of it. We'll be discussing a little bit about genetics, epigenetics and trauma, the, and human uh, brain development, how it develops, how it starts, why it is the way it is, and then some of the hallmarks of healthy and unhealthy brain development. So let's get rolling. This is the awe slide. Isn't that cute? So on the left, we have a one-day-old foal, and on the right, we have a one-day-old human baby. Now, okay, so it's day one, uh, but there's a lot of differences between these two. Both cute. All right, we'll give them that. But the issue is the human baby is far more dependent on a caregiver than the foal is. The foal can run and walk on day one. That's going to take the human baby over a year uh, to be able to do. And the reason for that is some things that have to do with human evolution. When our ancestors began to walk upright, that changed a lot of things, particularly in brain development there now needed to be a lot more things going on in the human frontal lobe, spatial relations, um, this all this independent movement that comes, being able to see further, all of these things demanded more brain space. So bigger brain means bigger skull. Another problem was as we became upright, the hips narrowed to be able to better support our weight and have us be uh, in a vertical orientation. So the problem becomes childbirth. The hips are narrower, the skull is bigger. That's not, uh, that's not such a great arrangement. So the evolutionary workaround was that unlike other animals, the human, I would say about 90% of brain development happens after birth. So as opposed to other animals, including our closest relative, the chimpanzee, they don't have all this post-birth brain development because of all of the other skills we've developed, and you can throw in language skills and social skills and all of the other things, the trade-off is that the human infant is born extremely dependent and needy and reliant on a caregiver. Um, and that's the trade-off. I believe by the age of three, the human brain is at 70% of its size while the body is at 18% of its size. So that ages one to three are a really critical period uh, for brain development. So here's a little bit uh, of a better picture of how this works in humankind. You can kind of see how, as we begin to walk more upright, you see how the shape of the skull, there's a lot more mass uh, in the skull. And a lot of this is, is frontal lobe development. And as you see with tool use and independent movement of the hands and walking upright, all of these things contribute to brain growth, contribute to skull growth, and also necessitate this being born in a very uh, dependent and defenseless manner. I guess another alternative would, would be that you, you would also have a longer time of gestation, which there's limits on all these things as well. So for healthy brain, there's a couple things we need. Uh, physical security, the baby has to be physically safe. There has to be nutrition. And the one that doesn't get all of the press that the other two get, consistent emotional nurturing. The relationship with a caregiver is critical. It, it, in fact, in the one of the books I'll talk about at the end, they really talk about the adult brain programming the child brain. And to do that, you have to have an adult that is physically safe and emotionally present. And that's not a given. And it's absolutely critical in those first three years because there's so much going on during this time. 
And part of that is not only are brain connections being made during that time, but brain connections are also ending during that time. We're actually born with more neural connections than we have as an adult, more than we need. So the genetics is a series of switches. And then epigenetics are all of these non-genetic things that flip these switches in the environment that make us who we are. So you can have identical twins or two specimens of the same plant, and they're going to grow different. They're going to have different differences to them, in part because how they've interacted with their environment. So in the, in the field of mental health, we've talked for years about genetics and environment, but I think the piece we've missed is this sort of epigenetics piece in the middle. So we may start with all the same switches, but as you keep hitting those different switches, the, the personality, the organism becomes an individual, even from others that may be a genetic match. And it's very important to mention that where you have healthy connections, healthy brain connections are made. Where you have adverse events, where you have a stressed or non-present caregiver or parent, the child learns that too. When you are in this position of dependency for three years, it is in the baby's best interest to know what kind of shape the caregiver is in. Is the caregiver present? Is the caregiver responsible? Is the caregiver concerned or frightened about something? Babies sense that. They have to sense that. They can't defend themselves. So what they have to do is they have to be able to read where their caregiver is. And so traumas, and whether that is traumas of a physical medical nature or of an environmental nature, it almost doesn't matter, has an impact not only on how an organism grows in relation to its environment, but even on a very basic biological level. So in the case of humans, brain development goes until 26 or maybe even 30, uh, depending on what you're reading. And that, that really critical period from one to three that we were talking about where so much of this is concentrated. So let's take one example of a lifetime here. And this is a, so this is an individual and everything goes pretty much smooth all the way through. Conception, birth, this epigenetic period, child, adolescence, adulthood, right up until 25 or 26 when brain development is concluded. So all this time, the brain is developing in league with having the nutrition, having the physical safety, having the emotionally and physically pre present um, parent or adult to help interact with that, with that child. So this is, this is kind of the optimal, this is what we want. Now, however, it doesn't always work that way, things happen. And when these things happen, not only do they happen in an environmental sense, but they also lead to changes biologically. And with those biological changes, they can lead to predetermination toward addiction, toward mental illness, toward physical illness, all sorts of things. So in this example, we have someone conception, birth, the epigenetic period, child, everything was fine. And okay, here comes a potentially traumatic stressor in adolescence, the death of a family member. And doesn't mean that everybody who's had a death in their family member in adolescence has, you know, PTSD or there, there will be long reaching consequences from that trauma, but it has the capacity to flip some of these switches and direct brain development in addition to just changing how that person's life is going to be different without a family member. So this is one potentially traumatic stressor, but it can also lead to, I'm sure some of you be able to relate to this, where that can be a turning point in a person's life, both environmentally and biologically. So let's ratchet this up a little bit. So in this situation, we have an example of a life that has lots of complications in it. There was problems around birth. Uh, mother was very stressed in that critical epigenetic period where that caregiving, that nurturing caregiving piece is so critical. Dem the child witnesses domestic violence as a child. And then we kept the death in the family stressor. So now we have multiple stressors in childhood. And if you're familiar with your adverse childhood experiences scale, you know, this is like a scale of four where things start to become significant. So each of these things, in addition to having an impact on the environment and worldview of that organism, also affect brain development. So this can lead to a predetermination toward uh, depression, hypertension, addiction. I just picked those randomly, but it can be any number of things that are a consequence of the interaction between these traumas and the environment and the, and the developing brain. And very often people with severe and persistent mental illness and, and, and addictions 
have had many of these stressors. This resembles their upbringing more than those first two examples that we were talking about. So you have multiple traumas, multiple impacts on the brain, um, and then these consequences. Now, traumas can also be resolved. It doesn't mean that they go away or disappear. Or it's like they never happened or that they, don't, that they did not have an impact on brain development. But if there is help available, it can help minimize the impact of that. Very often what we're doing is we're treating the secondary causes of trauma, addiction being a secondary cause, mental illness being a secondary uh, symptom of trauma or, um, or the medical problems. But the trauma was at the core of it and then that never gets addressed. Well, this is a situation identical to the one before, but here there has been something to address the trauma that is at the source of these, the depression, the hypertension, and the addiction. So now you can make progress on that. And that's often what the goal of trauma-informed care and what trauma treatment is, is it doesn't change what's happened to the brain, although you are still making changes in neural connections. I, I would put out that you could, you can undo or compensate for or minimize some of the damage that has been done if that trauma has been resolved. Now, in the addictions literature, we talk about these are some of the last areas to develop in the brain. And I want you to think about this. If you, if you work as a, a mental health professional, think about some of these areas and how they may be impacted in your clients. The reward system, you know, how people view rewards, you know, what, what their reward is for doing something. Incentive and motivation. Are they demotivated? Or are they motivated by things that aren't healthy for them and aren't motivated by things that are healthy? Self-regulation, particularly self-regulation of mood, being able to regulate um, uh, emotions. You know, and this is where we talk about the limbic system and also the frontal, uh, frontal lobe. And being able to respond to stress. So these are areas that develop last. So they're sort of at the pinnacle of all that development. So any problems that have happened in the development before impact these. And of course, you have the maximum amount of time for the environment to affect the development of those areas. And again, these areas set the table for addiction. Um, and of course, some of these other things that we've been talking about. So just to wrap this up, genetics are the studies of genes and genetic variations. Epigenetics is how those genetic pathways get switched on and off by the environment. And trauma for this purpose is any sort of shock to the system, any sort of negative event that happens uh, during the course of this brain development, whether it's a life event or something a little more biological. Uh, genetics set the parameters for the developing organism, and the environment also has a biological impact. It's not just the environment. And it is through the growth of neural connections and also the selective pruning of neural connections as well. This was all set in path by uh, evolution, the fact that we are walking upright, the fact that we are tool users and had so many needs for a bigger brain. And this bigger brain means that our brain development takes longer and has to happen outside of the, the confines of the the birth canal. Human brain development goes until at least 26. Uh, and again, some of those later events are much more susceptible to environmental traumas because that's a long time and lots of bad things can happen uh, during that time. And not only bad things happening to the infant themselves, but anything bad that happens to the caregiver immediately impacts the infant. It, it, they make the analogy of one computer programming another. And if the programming computer has a problem with it, those problems are automatically going to be passed on to the other computer. So where the material from this presentation came from were a pair of excellent books, uh, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts by Dr. Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, Mind and Body in the Healing of Trauma. Two excellent books if you do work in mental health, trauma or addictions. Uh, not easy reads, but I would call them necessary reads. So anyway, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure as always, and hope to see you in one of our uh, other presentations. Take care and be well.